Welcome to the Hornets Hivecast, the official podcast of your Charlotte Hornets. Here's your host, Sam Farber. Welcome to another edition of the Hornets Hivecast, your daily podcast with all the notes, quotes, and daily buzz around your favorite NBA team, the Charlotte Hornets. I'm Sam Farber, and it is a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us once again, a game day edition. Seems like every day is either a breakdown last night's game edition or a game day edition, but that's the 2020-2021 season. Tonight, it's Hornets at Knicks. We'll give you the preview for that contest. Also, talk about the best in-game dunkers in the game of all time we'll give you some of our favorites and what's the hornets possibilities of climbing this the totem pole for the standings once again now that they've finally gotten a win in their back pocket over portland can they start to climb just as they had started to fall with all the injuries over the last week and a half to help me out with all these topics we've got one of our best friends here on the hornets hivecast t-bone travis t-bone hancock you hear him on the pregame show on our flagship station sports radio fnz you can also hear him mornings on sports radio FNZ, as well as well, about every month or so here on the HHC. T-Bone, how are you? Good evening, Sir Samuel. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to talk to you. I have not spoken to you since the pregame show before the game against uh, my mind is my mind the Blazers. Portland, yes. And, uh, and I'm not going to talk to you again for for a while, probably another a couple hours. So it's <laughs> good to get good. I miss you. It's good to hear from you. I can't remember what the last game even was at this point. You're, 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 you're the same way. This schedule is just then you then when you look ahead. Like this next set of games tonight, the Knicks and all the games coming up, it doesn't get any easier in terms of like the days. It's like Tuesday and, and Thursday. It's, it's it's wild, the schedule right now. The only saving grace is that everyone's going through it. In fact, in some cases, like San Antonio, for instance, who missed so many games in the first half, they've been going with this no two days between games for the entire second half of the season and will continue to do so. So we're grateful to have basketball. That's the, the be all end all. And Everyone is dealing with the hectic schedule as it is. Hornets right now sitting in eighth place in the Eastern Conference. They got back to 500 with that win over Portland. There was an article recently in The Athletic talking about the possibilities for a four seed. And to be fair, the Hornets were kind of mentioned as an outlier as, hey, you know, mathematically they should be in this group, but realistically the authors were not considering them. But I thought it'd be a fun topic. So the Hornets potentially as a four seed. We know the big three in the East are basically set. It'll be some kind of order of Philadelphia, Brooklyn, and Milwaukee. Personally, I would not be surprised if any one of those three finished first, second, or third. I think the way that they're resting guys in certain cases or injuries or whatnot, there certainly could be some minor movement between those three. But that's the top three in the conference. The next group includes the Hornets, the Knicks, Miami, Atlanta, and Boston. And Indiana's been thrown out there as well, but I don't really think they're a threat for four, five, or six, but that's basically the group. And this article, while it was focused on whether or not the Hornets can reach the four seed, I think anything four through six right now is a huge win because while I believe the play-in tournament, Sorbonne, is the playoffs, not everyone feels that way. So getting in, bypassing the play-in tournament would be a real positive. The postseason's the postseason. So even the play-in tournament, to me, counts as the postseason. I think the the play-in's going to be fun all the way around when you look at potentially Steph Curry in the West in a one, one game or maybe two, depending on the seed. You're going to have Steph Curry possibly in a play-in situation. He's red hot, and then you, our Hornets here could be in that. But as far as the standings go, we found out a few hours ago that Miles Turner is out indefinitely with a toe injury. So that's certainly going to be a big factor for the Pacers in their chances as the Wizards now sort of make a move. And uh, they, they could certainly be a factor at the bottom end of the uh, – of that, that play-in uh, standing area. But as far as four, five, and six goes, you know, the, the Hornets conceivably, it's not over. They could breach that part of the standings. They play, well, Boston two more times, I believe, and they play the Knicks tonight. They play the Knicks to second the last game of the season or whatever that number is towards the very end. So there's opportunity there against some teams in front of them, but those teams in front of them are, are streaking. All three of them are. Atlanta, Boston, and the Knicks are all streaking. They're all healthier for the most part than the Hornets are. I think the Hornets would have a great chance to be in that Atlanta, Boston range, higher than the Knicks because of the talent level. The Knicks have done a great job. We'll talk about it here momentarily, but they've done a great job. But roster-wise, full roster with health, the Hornets are a much deeper, better team than the Knicks are. So I think the Hornets, if they were healthy, certainly would be in that Atlanta-Boston range with Borrego getting some potential Coach of the Year votes. It's just 
those teams are so much healthier for the most part than the Hornets are. So it's hard to see them making up that ground with about, what, 16, 17 games to go. I agree. I think with how banged up this team is, it's revealed just how good of a roster it is. Uh, what what a great job Mitch Kupchak and company did in the front office and the coaching job and development job James Borrego and his team have done because coming into the season, no one looked at the Hornets and said, wow, what a deep roster. But now Charlotte's been able to withstand significant injuries that have sidelined players for multiple weeks to Devontae Graham, Malik Monk, Gordon Hayward, LaMelo Ball, all guys that at different times have been one of the top three scorers on a consistent basis for this team, and the Hornets just keep on plugging in the next man, and they still find ways to make it work. But all that being said, I think from what the article was based around, and you can check it out at The Athletic, to make the four seed I think is too far-fetched. Realistically, it's going to take about 41 wins, I think, to even have a chance under the best of circumstances to grab the four seed. And that means the Hornets going 13-3. and T-Bone, they haven't had a 16-game stretch where they've gone 13-3 and all year. Their best is, I think, 10-6. and So as injured as they are, I just don't see it happening. But I do think making it as a top six seed is still possible. Boston's starting to play like that team we thought they were going to be, that sort of upper echelon, top three, four team in the East. Boston's starting to look like that finally. Atlanta, we knew when the year began how talented they were based off their drafting and then the free agents and money they spent. They just didn't, Boy Pierce was obviously a problem for them because they've taken off to have, what, a top three or four record since David Miller took over. So Atlanta and Boston are kind of, you know, it's not crazy to think where they're at. The Knicks are the one that have played so far above their heads, and that's the thing with the Hornets. While the Hornets have gone through these injuries and had the, had some losses here, the Knicks have somehow gone on to win six in a row. So you keep waiting for the Knicks to falter, and trust me, I do, and lose six out of seven and sort of become the Knicks. Well, they go on and win six in a row. So we didn't see for the long time, Sam. We talked about this a lot. It felt like for the longest time in the East, no one could put a string of wins together. It felt like, you know, a team got the two or three and then they'd fall back, lose three out of four, an injury happens or a stretch of games, they go west. It felt like forever in the East, no one could sustain a streak for very long. And then it's just bad timing for the Hornets that they have had to succumb a little bit because of injuries and other factors out of their control while other teams now start to streak. Now Boston's won six, the Knicks won six, the Hawks eight out of ten. So it's just the timing of, Teams finally got hot, and the Hornets have had to go through what they've gone through. But you're right, though. To say that they can't catch the Knicks, that, that to me would be a little bit false because the Knicks at any moment could become the Knicks. You know, they're not deep. They're an injury away from they're – no, they're not deep at all. So they're an injury away from falling off. So, yeah, I think the Knicks is still realistic, and they play the Knicks two more times as well here in the next 15, 16 games. So you're right. I don't, I don't know if they will catch the Knicks. But to say they can't, that would be false as well. The article's authors, John Hollinger, who does a great job covering the entire NBA, plus their Celtics writer, Jared Weiss, and their Hawks writer, Chris Kirshner, had it for Boston, five Atlanta, six Miami. They think Miami will sneak up and catch New York. We keep waiting for them, too. Like They're one of the teams you just kept waiting for, and they did for a while there, if you recall, Miami got hot up to like four momentarily during the season. And then they're one of those teams too that you keep waiting for them to go on a streak like the teams ahead of them have gone, the Atlantas and the Boston. But Miami's sort of been average to below average most of the year, right? Below their expectations, certainly. Yeah. But they're still close enough to the Knicks and considered by most teams to be, by most people, I would say, to be a better team than the Knicks in terms of their roster construction. So I think that's why those writers went that way. Overall, I think the Hornets have got control of their own destiny when it comes to the tiebreakers against the Knicks and Miami. So that's one in the win column for the Hornets. So if they can even get to tied, they would take the tiebreaker in theory or could take the tiebreaker. The other thing is that while Miami seems to have a more favorable schedule, at least in terms of who their opponent are they're not home nearly as much as the Hornets are Miami is going to play eight of their final 14 games on the road Hornets are kind of flipped they're they're more like nine eight or nine of their next 14 are at home so big advantage there to the Hornets and look optimistic you know what's possible I think 38 wins might might under the best of circumstances get sixth place and can the Hornets go 10 and six in their last 16, I think they can, especially 
if they get Gordon Hayward back, Malik Monk back, and Devontae Graham back in some order, let's say in the next three weeks. 38 is pretty impressive in a 72 game season. So, it certainly is. You know, if they if they played the regular 82, and you add, say, even just conservatively four more wins to that, or five, or split a dip, like 43, 42, 43 in the in a regular season, we'd be uh, we definitely be talking about what a year they had and what the future holds. And we still are, but in a short season, 38 would be very respectable. But in way above what Vegas projected, which we thought when the season began that Vegas has that number wrong for what was it, 25 or 26, whatever it was. That's so, correct. Yeah. Yeah, they could go. They may end up going 12, 13 over their projected wins. Hornets looking really good. It's a possibility the door is open for them to make it to six, but to do so, a win tonight would certainly help the cause. We'll talk about that in a moment. Coming up next, though, who's the best dunker in the NBA today? You know who our favorites are, but we'll give you our take on it next here on the Hornets Hivecast. Cody Zeller knows how to finish an assist. Now you can be a part of one of his biggest plays of the season. Socks are the most under-donated item for those in need, and the Cody Zeller Sock Drive presented by Haynes is ready to attack that problem. You can help make socks a priority by donating one pack of new socks or $5 to the Cody Zeller Sock Drive, and all donations will be matched by Haynes and will benefit Roof Above. Head to Hornets.com and search Cody Zeller Sock Drive for more information. Sam Farber and Travis T-Bone Hancock of Sports. Sports Radio FNZ here with you on the HHC Today. T-Bone, the dunks by Miles Bridges in the last week and a half have been amazing. I'm just hoping my calls are doing it justice. I know Eric's are. He just loses his mind every time. And the internet, I was listening around on Sports Talk Radio, and they're talking about how there's a shift. It's gone from, hey, this Hornets announcer goes crazy every time Miles Bridges makes a dunk or Terry Rozier makes a free throw to, we got to listen to this Eric Collins guy. Like, the world knows his name now, and they should because he's a spectacular announcer. Announcer, great person too, but a spectacular announcer. So we're glad to see that. But the reason any announcer gets attention is based off what the team does. And lately, Miles Bridges has been doing some incredible things dunking at the rim. I love talking about dunkers, and I love it more from the sense of the in game dunks, the guys in the moment that do the best, the guys that dunk on top of people. Dunk contests are great. What Vince Carter did. 20 plus years ago it's sensational one of the best events we've ever seen by an athlete performance wise but you know not every dunker is great in dunk contests right like miles bridges did his a couple years ago and he wasn't great but miles in game when he can dunk on people like he did clint capella that's special to watch i love talking about guys in the game that can catch up bodies. This is one of my favorite topics for sure now i agree with you i think dunk contests are fun for like the gimmicky stuff Like, you know, going back even to, this wasn't a gimmick, but, you know, Michael Jordan taking off from the foul line, Blake Griffin dunking over a car, and even this last year, Anthony Simons, you know, using the little mini hoop to place a ball three quarters of the way up the backboard just so he could, you know, so that way next year someone could put it on top of the backboard and and try and one-up him. But, you know, those kinds of things I think are fun for dunk contests. in-game dunks are ones you don't always see coming. Dunk contests, you know a guy's about to run up and do something. But in an in-game dunk, you don't don't always know when you're about to see that's part of the you talk about you know this because your calls are great too but the Eric Collins calls as well it's that spontaneity of the moment when all of a sudden you don't see it coming you just lose your mind those are the ones I love and uh, historically we are talking about some great ones here I'm sure you know I think just to focus in on what the play is I liken it to like a premium defensive end versus a premium offensive tackle in football Like, these are two of the best athletes, biggest athletes on the field. And while there's everything else is going on around them, in that moment when it's a sack or a a pancake block, it's one-on-one. It's who's the better athlete, who can beat who on this play. And that's similar to what we see with Miles Bridges thundering down the lane against the Clint Capella. There's the biggest, baddest offensive lineman in the NBA waiting, and here comes the defensive end who's trying to use that speed rush move to get in over the top. And it's just fun to see whatever the result is. But in terms of who the best dunkers are, I'll leave it to you because you brought up the topic. Do you want to talk today? Do you want to talk all time? How do you want to frame this? Let's talk all time. I think Zach Levine, now Zach Levine's up there as well. He's a guy that with some flair. Eric Gordon. Now, I don't know if there's as many I can think of right now. Miles might be the, he's the hottest one right now, right? 
the Anthony Edwards one he had against Toronto is the noise they make also, right? On a great dunk, the crunch of the, the bodies hitting and just the rim. And Anthony Edwards has one of the most vicious ones we've seen in terms of that noise. But all time, there's a couple that I like. First of all, I'm not putting Miles Bridges on the level of Vince Carter, Sean Kemp, Dominique Wilkins. He's having a stretch similar to those guys. He's not there yet. He's still young. He's growing. I, I think Vince Carter, there's another guy in here too I find underrated. I'll explain in a minute. But I think Vince Carter and Sean Kemp from my generation, my era, that's got to be the two best in games because of two that stand out in the stories that go with them. So if you recall, when Vince was on the Nets, he really caught Alonzo morning, right, on that dunk where he kind of like climbed up Alonzo and he kind of dunked on top of him. It was such a nasty dunk. Vince Carter tells a story on the Up and Smoke podcast with Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes. Alonzo Mourning didn't speak to Vince Carter for six years. That's how bad that dunk was. That's how embarrassed Alonzo was because there's a whole story that goes by it. But that's how nasty that dunk was. Didn't talk to the guy. They were friends. Didn't talk for six years. How bad is that? That's pretty epic. You know, I look at it from for who the best is, kind of in that, that sack versus an offensive tackle rush end standpoint like you know it's one thing if you get a free rush and like what kind of acrobatic thing are you willing to try but really the the purpose of a dunk the purpose is to ensure you get those two points like you don't want to let that lay in perhaps dink off the tin or some shot blocker to come from behind you're looking to stuff it through the cylinder and ensure you get the points and from that standpoint I think Miles is up there maybe one of the best of all time you know Blake Griffin was a phenomenal leaper when he first came out. I think Miles is a more complete player right now, but Blake's athleticism was off the charts. He might be up there. And then, you know, I don't know if we're considering centers, but I don't recall too many people ever blocking Shaquille O'Neal. That's the one I was, I just said one is underrated. And that's the one I was going to say. Just the pure brutality of ripping down baskets. I was watching yesterday on YouTube the one against the Knicks from the early 2000s when he dunks on Chris Dudley and he, <laughs> and he, he pushes Dudley into the camera well area, the camera guys. And then Chris Dudley gets mad and tries to throw the ball at his head like a dodgeball. But that's what Shaq would do to people. It was never going to be a dunk contest guy, but man, Shaq's just pure force. I did a top five of this back in the winter and i had shack in my top five just for pure brutality and if, if there was youtube by the way or, or social media back when sean kemp was in his prime go back and watch like a two-minute video on sean kemp right now and try to imagine sean kemp with the twitter era the crunch and the noise and the force and the embarrassment that he caused dudes he dunked on Sean Kemp now would be just an absolute sensation on social media. Well, you, T-Bone, are the sports talk host, so I'll let you have the final word. Miles Bridges, is he in the top five for best in-game dunkers of all time? He's not in the top five of all time yet, because then you got to count like uh, the, the owner of the Hornets, Michael Jordan's in there, Dominique Wilkins. I'd say that he's not there yet. I think when it when he gets some more under the belt there, he can approach that. I wouldn't say he's top five yet. I, I think that if there's a list and it's extended out 15 or so, he's probably on there because there's a lot of great dunkers historically. But certainly we're having a discussion about it, so he's making a move towards the list. Is he the best in the game today? Yeah, like I said, Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon are up there. And I can't forget Zion either. Zion is a guy that's at that force category. So I think that he's uh, – I think he is – I think he is right now. I think he's certainly the hottest dunker in the game right now. He got 44 million views on a dunk on social media the last week against Capella. So number one on Sports Center. Yeah, he's caught the eye of a lot of people. I believe you were also on Sports Center. Well, that w- that was because of Miles, but the call made the cut. So I'm grateful to Miles for the extra exposure for Hornets Radio Network and Sports Radio FNZ, our flagship. Hey, uh, we got some breaking news here, T Bone. So we're going to get into that next segment as we preview Hornets versus Knicks tonight. Coming up next here on the HHC. Hornets fans, during the month of April, the Charlotte Hornets and their official hunger relief partner, Food Lion Feeds, are launching the 2021 Dunk Hunger Food Drive to benefit Second Harvest Food Bank of Metrolina. The Bridges who throws it down with a right hand. For every Hornets dunk this month, slams it down with two hands. Food Lion will donate 1,000 meals. Terry Rozier throws it down. 
shot over Kevin Durant. For more information on how you can help Food Lion and the Hornets dunk hunger, visit hornets.com slash dunk hunger. Sam Farber and Travis T-Bone Hancock of Sports Radio FNZ here with you today on the Hornets Hivecast. You can hear T-Bone mornings on FNZ. You can also hear him tonight previewing the Hornets game against the Knicks. And before we preview it here, we got some breaking news, T-Bone. Just off the presses, this is from the Hornets PR staff, Charlotte Hornets announced guard LaMelo Ball underwent further evaluation on his right wrist today by Dr. Michelle Carson of the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Ball's cast was removed. A CT scan confirmed the wrist has healed. He's been cleared to return to individual basketball activity. Additional updates on Ball's status and return to game action will be provided as appropriate. Now, the original timeline was four weeks from surgery, he hurt the wrist back on March 20th. We were expecting the 20th of this month to be the actual timeline, or that, that would have met, I should say, the timeline. So that would have been today anyways. They get it in 24 hours ahead of schedule, basically. But this is big news here. Now, this does not mean LaMelo Ball is playing tonight against the Knicks. That's not what it means. It means he is going to start to progress towards a return to play which certainly seems to leave open the window for him to play again this season. That was my thing when he first went out. They said out for the season. I thought, well, in a regular year, yeah, that would be the case because of the schedule, the timing. But in this case, the Hornets catch a break because of the schedule. In the regular season, extended out a month longer than normal. I thought, well, if he's out four weeks, there's going to be some time to get him back. So uh, then the question was, where are the Hornets at? How much do they try to push them back? And that's certainly going to be something they decide here of, of how quickly they try to get them back. And certainly they may. I, I don't know. But that is tremendous news. And that's finally a, a good piece of positive injury news for our Charlotte Hornets. I haven't had much of that lately, right? Some good news because certainly the news on Malik Monk hasn't been good lately. So this is good to hear about Lamelo Ball, the, uh, the, the superstar of the future for this team. Definitely a positive. I had started comparing, like Yusuf Nurkic, we just saw the other night when the Hornets played Portland. And I would never say every wrist injury is the same because there's so many bones in there saying wrist fracture. You know, that's like saying, you know, lower body injury in hockey. Like, well, what, where exactly was that injury? Like, well, we want to be vague because it's hockey. Like, okay, thank you. That's very helpful. But wrist injury, there's a lot of variables to that. But when Nurkic was out, he missed two months and two weeks from date of injury till he had recovered enough to play. So let's not go crazy here and assume that LaMelo is coming back for sure in a week, a month before the end of the season. It's not guaranteed. We just know he is healed, he is healthier, and he can start rehabilitating towards a return. We'll try and get more later on today on the pregame show. We have no history of his injury. He's so young. Some guys bounce back differently. We, we don't know, right? So we, we don't know how guys heal and bounce back, how long it takes. We can figure it out over time. Hey, yeah, he's a guy that bounces back quick or doesn't or whatever. We don't know LaMelo and how he bounces back from these things. So this will be the first time we get a chance to see this. No idea at all. No idea at all. And, and you know, who, is this a, a strengthen up your wrist and then get out there and play because you can't hurt it again? Or is there a, a longer timeline and benchmarks to meet? You know, we'll, we'll try and get more information. Again, tune in tonight to the Hornets pregame show on Sports Radio FNZ. We'll have all of the latest that we can come up with starting at 6.30 tonight. But as for the specific matchup with the Knicks, T-Bone, New York has been on a great run. They had won six in a row. Really great job by Tom Thibodeau coaching this team up. Julius Randle has been all-star. He's had a spectacular season. Overall, though, my opinion is, while the Knicks are a good story, the Hornets are not a good matchup for the Knicks. The Knicks are a very good defensive team. I think they excel when there's an elite player on the other side that they can focus in on and try to take away. And the tricky thing about the Hornets is they play such great team basketball, they would encourage you to try and do that because they'll just find somebody else to fill it up who's got a better matchup. Yeah, that's been the storyline with the Knicks is they leave the league in fewest points per game allowed, and they are, as of yesterday or two days ago, they're at 104 points per game. To put that in perspective, the team that's in fifth in that category gives up 111. So it shows you how good defensively they are. You're right, Julius Randle deserves to be All-NBA. Just been sensational. R.J. Barrett defensively has come alive, and he's shooting 55% from three over his last, I don't know if it's 10 games in the neighborhood. And Nerlens Noel is the number one center in the league for defensive plus minus, and he's the backup center filling in for the injured Mitchell Robinson. So 
Tom Thibodeau's got this team defending like it's the uh, mid-90s again. But you're right, though. I think full rostered Hornets gives them a big-time problem because of all the guys that can contribute. You're right. That's a great point by you. They can't they can't zone in on one guy when Hayward and Lamelo and Buck and all these guys, Rogier and PJ. That's a tough team for anybody to defend, never mind just the Knicks. We'll have to see right now with the Hornets. Can they – does Devontae play? right tonight does, does he go that'll certainly be big if it's just Rogier out there well they can zone in on him and if they limit Rogier, that can limit the hornets but you're right if they were playing in a play-in game full roster full roster i think that benefits the hornets but for right now without all the guys in the lineup i'm not sure that that is applicable to the nice matchup i think personally if Devonte graham does play it's big advantage Hornets in this one because they can spread you out so much and they've got so many different shooters out there and two players now to run the offense that I think the Hornets will just have the upper hand. They'll have the better roster at that point. If he doesn't, I think it depends on who gets hot. And that can go for either team. I would agree with you that they're going to do everything they can to take Terry Rozier away, but we've seen it before. You can try and take Terry away. If he gets hot, you're not slowing him down. He has reached that status. But even if you do try and take him away, if P.J. Washington goes for five threes, if Miles Bridges is hitting his deep ball, you know, if this team can get a player or two hot and the Knicks do not, then I think it's basically a toss-up at that point. But I think if Devontae plays and can do anything close to what P.J. Washington did in his return, I think watch out. This is an advantage Hornets game. And Alec Burks has COVID. He's been big for the Knicks off the bench, so we don't know his status as of this recording. So we'll see what his status is for the Knicks. Well, Julius Randle pretty much gets what he gets every game. Now against Dallas, he had 44, had a huge game against the Pelicans on Sunday. Julius is, is pretty much getting whatever he wants to get. He has been phenomenal this year almost unstoppable he's a lefty he's unorthodox he gets to his spots and you can hardly stop it he everything that he puts up pretty much in the paint area goes in the basket so you're pretty much going to have to just concede that Julius Randle's probably going to get between 22 and beyond because that's just what his numbers have been the key for the Knicks and when they're playing well and I referenced this when we started the Knicks breakdown it's when RJ Barrett shoots well from the outside because he can drive it he can defend on the other end when he spreads the, because they don't have great shooters in there. That's the thing. They don't have great outside shooters. Randall can do it, but they don't have, they've lost a lot of close games to good teams because they just can't hit the big shot down the stretch from the outside. RJ Barrett shooting 55% from three in his last handful of games. And that's why they've won six in a row. He's extending the core. He's extending the floor. He's a weapon out there now. And when RJ Barrett is hitting shots, that opens up the court more for Julius Randle. So I think Randle's going to get his against anybody right now. For the Hornets to have success tonight, they have to hope R.J. Barrett isn't hitting shots. When he's not hitting shots, the Knicks are a different team, and it's all on Julius Randle. T-Bone and Kyle Bailey will have the full pregame diagnosis rundown preview for you coming up at 6.30 this evening on our flagship station, Sports Radio FNZ. And he'll be up early as well, depending on what time you get this podcast. If you're one of our early risers listening right when it drops around 2 in the morning, good for you. Thanks for tuning in and being a loyal listener. But if it's early enough, you might not have missed T-Bone yet. And if you did already, well, wake up early tomorrow and catch him on our flagship station, Sports Radio FNZ. T-Bone, good news today. Lamelo is healed and is on the recovery path. Hornets have a, a winnable game tonight, you'd think, against the Knicks and seem to be getting healthier. And you kind of shied away from Miles Bridges' best dunker in the game right now, but we'll forgive you. No, I think he's up there for right now with, with Zion, probably. But in terms of the all-time list, he's getting up there, too. It's just a matter of putting some more on the resume. And uh, he's still young. He's got a lot more dunks to go. And hopefully tonight against the Knicks, he throws some down as well. I'm just happy that it's gone from a conversation about the shorthanded Hornets to now the hopeful Hornets. And we'll continue it with you tonight. T-Bone, thanks, as always, for joining us here on the Hornets Hivecast. Anytime, pal. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. A reminder, we'll have our breakdown podcast tomorrow of tonight's game against the Knicks. Till then, for everyone here, I'm Sam Farber saying it's been a pleasure and a privilege having you with us on the HHC and in the words of LaMelo Ball. Thank y'all. Have a good day. Wear your mask. Thanks for listening to the Hornets Hivecast. For more coverage, visit Hornets.com.